Hi, Ron Gonzalez here, President and CEO of the Hispanic Foundation. The following recording is our Latinx Speaker Series event on Friday, December 10th, 2021. For many years, the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley has taken tremendous pride in being a subject area expert on the needs of our Silicon Valley Latino community. In 2011, we published our very first Silicon Valley Latino report card which gave a glimpse into how Latinos were faring in Silicon Valley, and the data at that time was not good. In our 2018 Latino report card, we found that not much had changed. The housing crisis, yes, crisis, continued to impact our families. Latino high school student dropout rates were very high, higher than non-Latino students, and the health of our community continued to decline. In 2018, no one could have predicted what we would be facing in 2020 with the COVID-19 pandemic, which has now lasted more than 20 months. We convened in anticipation of the 2023 Latino Report Card to see where we are now and how we can, as a community, continue to come together to turn this vicious tide. Please take a moment to subscribe and like our YouTube channel, which helps expand our network beyond our immediate reach. Now, without further ado, the Latinx Speaker Series event, the 2018 Latino Report Card, then and now. Enjoy. It's now time and my pleasure to introduce our panel for this afternoon. And I am humbled to be surrounded by these five amazing panelists who've been working for the Silicon Valley Latinx community for many years. They were present at the Latino Report Card presentation back in August 2018. And I'm welcoming Danielle Cedeno, Leslie Crosiglia, Gina Dalma, Dr. Marianne Dewan, and Carla Rodriguez Lomax. Now, I'm sure that you all previously read the amazing bios of our panelists. So we'll just get right into the conversation. So let's start with the most important area of education. Superintendent Dewan, back in 2018, you reported that the education section of the report card got a C. Now, we've included on the screen some few data points from that report card in 2018 as a reference. Supervisor Dewan, Superintendent Dewan, my apologies. If you could give a grade to this section right now, what would it be and why? Thank you so much for having me back today to provide this important update. And thank you for all that you do for our community and our students. Um, I think our grade would remain the same uh, during this, this period of time. Since our last report card in 2018, the education sector has been advancing policy and funding shifts to address gaps in achievement and access, many of which we identified in the 2018 report. And many of the traditional ways that we measure our educational progress were severely disrupted due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Beginning with a 2019-2020 school year, for example, state assessments and accountability measures just simply could not occur. Graduation rates across the state have been fairly consistent over the past few years, and our AGG course completion rates, which are one proxy for college readiness, steadily increased over the last four years in Santa Clara County with gains of approximately 5% in all groups. However, even with that increase, and the Latinx student group did experience that increase, um, their um, rate is still lower than the state, about 2.5% lower. COVID-19 exacerbated inequities that existed before the pandemic, including the digital divide and mental health and wellness. And our Latinx communities were especially impacted by the <clears throat> pandemic with higher rates of disease transmission. Schools across the Bay Area are seeing declines in student enrollment driven by lower birth rates and for families with children, the high cost of childcare and housing is driving them out of the area. The evidence remains strong that when children have access to quality early care and education, they are better prepared for kindergarten, are more likely to read by third grade, and more likely to stay on track for high school graduation. And data shows that there's an alarming increase in the numbers of young people with anxiety, and depression, who are experiencing trauma, social isolation, and substance use. 
recognizing this in our schools means acknowledging that we really cannot separate health from education and we must invest in the health and wellness of children by integrating a focus on well-being in our schools. Schools are centers of wellness focused on physical, emotional, academic, and behavioral health. There are four key policy changes that I see as pivotal to changing the trajectory of our Latinx students that have occurred since our last report card. Universal school meals, universal transitional kindergarten, expansion of subsidized preschool and childcare, and expansion of school-based behavioral health and wellness services. With these new investments being rolled out in the next few years, we will be monitoring their impact on the overall well-being, school readiness, and academic achievement of our Latinx students. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dewan. And I really like that uh, the emphasis there at the end around some of the solutions that are gonna be put into place in the next few years, particularly the emphasis on preschool education, accessibility, affordability, study after study have shown over many decades now the value of, of making preschool accessible and affordable to low-income families. So I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. And we'll come back to you later in the, in the workshop here to get some more inputs. But thank you so much for your in-depth analysis over the last couple of years. We do know that you know from our own education programs, and we want to thank again both you and the County Board of Education for your financial support of our uh, STEM program activities. Uh, and uh, uh, we know from those programs that the, the impact just of COVID-19 on our students has been tremendously negative. So we've got a lot of work to do for sure. We'll have to roll up our sleeves together as a community. Thank you. Agreed. So let's turn now to the important area of Latino health. Carla, you know, back in 2018, your wonderful CEO, Irene Chavez, who unfortunately could not join us today, reported that the health section of the report also re or received a D. Now we've included some a few data points also from the report on the screen as a reference point. Now, what are you seeing in your neck of the woods? You, you're involved in health every single day as, a, as an executive with Kaiser Permanente. If you were to give a grade to this section now, what would it be and why? Thank you, Ron, and thank you for having me today. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, I think in what we may see as a running theme is that the impacts of the pandemic, um, you know, were big for, uh, for health care. Um, we believe that this shifted our grade in health down uh, to a D minus and possibly even un unfortunately lower. So much changed over the past two years alone because of the pandemic, but at the same time, they were not new issues that we saw come forward, but rather what, what it did is it exacerbated existing disparities in work, education, housing, and healthcare. And as you know, it's not necessarily biological differences between racial groups that drive racial disparities in health, but rather it's social conditions that influence health. It's those social determinants of health, as I just mentioned. In looking at the graphs, we do believe that health insurance coverage for adults and ch children remains largely the same. Um, however, when it comes to physical fitness of seventh graders, body mass index uh, for adults, obesity and children, we believe that um, it has worsened for everyone. The pandemic negatively impacted uh, many, if not all health issues that the Latinx community is facing. Um, not only did many of us defer care during the pandemic, the results of which we're seeing now as everyone returns back to see their physicians and receive care. Um, but we've also seen negative impacts to mortality, substance abuse, and the mental health crisis, as Dr. Dewan referred to, especially of concern for us with um, teenagers. And then you can't dismiss that interconnection between all of those health issues. So as an example, you know, Latinos are at an increased risk for serious illness if they contract COVID. And because we have higher rates of underlying health conditions, such as diabetes, asthma, hypertension, and obesity, it negatively impacted our community um, in a big way. Well, thank you so much, Carla. I know about six months ago, I, I've not seen it more recently. The, unfortunately, the COVID-19 death rate amongst La Santa Clara County Latinos was almost about 20%, I mean, sorry, about twice as much of our percentage of population in the general public. Are you seeing that our, our the members of our community are doing a better job of getting the vaccinations and getting the boosters? What, uh, what's your sense of that aspect, just that basic task of getting that 
prevention done? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing that the numbers increase, but there's still a lot of hesitancy, right? I think all of us have been focusing in at every level of the community and trying to educate um, and provide additional resources and comfort level for folks, but there still is a lot of hesitancy. Um, and, and we're seeing it locally and, and more broadly than that. You know, I, I, that's a good point. And, you know, I, I remember there for a while in the kind of the first six months of the, the pandemic, there was a lot of concern about accessibility for low-income families, for Latino families, and the county and a, a number of nonprofits kind of responded to that with with uh, localized uh, vaccination centers, those types of things. And and I don't know if it just you know if I again I'm not stayed totally up to date on this stuff, but are those efforts continuing? Are are, are we still you know making making sure our community knows that the, the vaccinations are literally down the street from where they live or work? Absolutely, those efforts are continuing in a very strong way. Um, we're seeing vaccination sites at schools on site there for families where they can see them. Everyone's getting creative, partnering with the YMCA, providing memberships to the community as an incentive to come in. All of those things are still actively happening. I think everyone understands the importance of that. Um, and so everyone's really getting in there and doing the work. Great, well, that's good to hear, very encouraging. And I know just from, you know, having been the mayor that, you know, you, you lead by example. So I want to make sure everybody in the, in the audience knows that I've gotten my three vaccinations, my booster and my flu shot. So I'm I'm uh, I'm Superman right now. So we'll see how long that lasts. Thanks again, Carla. We'll be back to you shortly. Now, we know from past report cards and we're already learning now the 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 connection, the interconnection between all of these areas. And it's one of the reasons we chose these five areas to focus on in the very first report card back in 2011, education, health, financial stability, housing, and the environment. And all of our report cards and our future report card will, will gather data around these same areas. But obviously with the impact of COVID-19, there will be a different, you know, different slant to the report. I'm sure that a lot of uh, data will be brought into the report regarding the pandemic and its impact on our quality of life in these five areas. Now, speaking of another quality, quality of life area, financial health, you know, the financial stability of our community. Now, Gina, back in 2018, you helped us report that the financial stability section of the report card got a D. From the perspective of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, we know you're seeing firsthand the request of, I'm guessing, hundreds of nonprofits in the area of financial stability. In the 2018 report card, we asked Latino families how they were faring financially compared to the previous year. We also asked them how the next five years would look, if they would look better for, they would be better off financially or worse off. Gina, what do you think those families, and how do you think those families will answer those questions and others around the future uh, uh, and their financial stability? What's your take? So thanks, Ron, uh, for having me today. And unfortunately, I think if you were to ask Latinx, uh, Latinx families what they say, what they would say uh, of how they're faring today, uh, unfortunately, um, th there is no failing grade uh, here. But uh, but I think they're worse off uh, now compared to 2018. Um, and and let me tell you just what we know. Right um, over the past ten years. Uh, we know that the financial inequity in Silicon Valley uh, has grown at twice the rate of the rest of the state and the rest of the country. We know the Latinx residents have incomes that are 60% lower than that of white residents. We know uh, that they represent 30% uh, of the general population, yet represent more than 60% of those experiencing homelessness. Um, and just looking at the 2020 census numbers, uh, Latinx communities now account for nearly 20% of the U.S. population and are the fastest growing demographic group in California. And, and then came the pandemic. And we cannot, uh, we cannot ignore the disproportionate income that the pandemic ha had on our Latinx uh, communities, especially here in Silicon Valley. So um, the Latinx um, uh, residents shouldered not only the health implications that Carla just spoke about, but the heaviest economic devastation of the pandemic. Uh, Black and Latinx individuals filed unemployment claims, um, uh, uh, insurance claims, um, at rates of like two to five percent higher than than their white counterparts. We know that forty two percent. Um, of, um, of its, um, 
yeah, we know that 40% of um, Latinx, uh, Latinx families are 40% um, higher rates of um, risk for um, eviction, for food insecurity, right? They weren't only on the front lines of the pandemic, but they, they bore the disparate impact of the pandemic. So um, let, let's go to businesses. Um, compared to white owned businesses, almost twice as many as many Latinx businesses uh, closed from February 2020 to April 2020. And our, our nonprofit partners um, that we are in communication constantly um, are working with Latinx communities and are echoing the same urgencies around uh, food insecurity, around housing in, in insecurity, around the cost of living in Silicon Valley being exorbitant um, and job security. So, uh, so all in all, uh, Ron, uh, this is not a pretty picture. It certainly is not. And, you know, uh, one of the things that we've always found interesting in the, uh, the report cards is no matter what all the other conditions are like, our workforce uh, in involvement in our workforce is very, very high. And, and it'll be interesting to see, given the cost of housing and, and all these other things that have happened to our community and the fact that our community continues to shrink as a percentage of the general population. It'll be interesting to see if our workforce participation levels are still high, because what that will probably mean is our, our folks are not living here, they're still working here, which means they're traveling more to and from work, which then is a whole nother mental health issue, amongst other things in terms of the health of your family. Now, organizations like the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, of course, quickly responded to the pandemic, uh, releasing funds for all kinds of things, including emergency housing, emergency food, uh, and but you've also done something else in the, and you've been leading this effort with another uh, a number of other uh, foundations uh, and that's the development of a new Latinx fund. You want to talk about that share that with our audience because it's a, I think it's a great response to the pandemic among other things. Of course, Ron, and you heard me. Uh, you heard me while I was trying to to talk about Latinx. That I said Latinx sell well because I've been speaking so much about it, and we're very excited. This is a ten million dollar three year initiative uh, to really fund uh, leaders that have been disinvested in in the past. Latinx leaders leading organizations that are serving the Latinx community. This is really around uh, investing in the power. Uh, of Latinx leaders towards self-determination for their communities. This is around building movements around issues that we uh, as a Latinx community care about. This is really at, uh, uh, having a seat at the table uh, to ensuring that we are uh, driving solutions uh, that our community needs. So incredibly, incredibly exciting effort. We we have raised um, we have raised close to two point uh, I don't want to seven million dollars, um, and we've got uh, a bunch of folks that are ready to invest uh, in the in Latinx uh, leaders uh, in our community, driving solutions. So just incredibly exciting. Thank you for mentioning. Right. No, my pleasure, and thank you for getting this going. And don't stop at three million. When you get to three, just reset the goal to four. And and to the audience, if any of out, out there, any of you out there, want to uh, know more about this this program, contact Gina Dama. Make a contribution. Remember, we're not talking about contributions of half a million dollars. If every one of us donated a hundred bucks. She'd make that four million dollars in one month. So, and the goal is ten way. million. And the goal is ten million. So oh, right, ten million. Right. Well, we'll, we'll get you. We'll get you to four in the next six weeks. How's that sound? <laughs> All right. Uh, next, an issue that is so important to me uh, as mayor of San Jose, I had the wonderful honor of working with our next panelist, Leslie Corsiglia, as we work together to try, even then, to begin to be a regional leader, a national leader in the area of affordable housing. She and I and the city councils at the time, we were proud to be uh, responsible for building 11,000 affordable homes in just the eight years I was mayor. And I'm proud of the fact that that's more, that's more affordable homes built in any other city in the state of California, including Los Angeles. So Leslie Corsiglia, uh, she's been working on regional housing issues for decades. Back in 2018, the grade for housing was also a D. So please tell me that you're the bearer of some good news and that we might what we can expect some improvements in the next report card around housing go ahead Leslie. what do you think uh thank you ron and and thank you uh to to all of you for having this chance to to talk today 
You know, unfortunately, um, I can't be the bearer of good news. Um, I, I do believe that things, uh, looking at the charts that you now have on the slide, that, that things have not changed much since 2018. But there is some good news and bad news. Uh, so first, the bad. Um, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, more people are experiencing economic hardship and are more housing insecure and more people are homeless than, than they were three years ago. Uh, as some of the other panelists have talked about, the wealth gap has continued to grow and uh, those who can leave the area, uh, many are choosing to leave to go to places that, that uh, offer more affordable options. Uh, we, are, we continue to have concerns about the COVID-19 eviction and foreclosure cliff. We don't yet know the totality of the fallout. Luckily, there has been some rental assistance that's been uh, provided to, to residents to help keep them uh, stable, uh, but uh, we're still concerned uh, that there will be some displacement as a result uh, of the pandemic. And with home ownership, prices have risen amazingly, 25% um, in the last few years from what was 1.2 million uh, back in 2018 and to 1.5 million today. And home ownership rates for Latinx families continues to lag uh, those of, of white and Asian families and households. Rents have remained stable, but it still requires significant uh, annual salaries. With a current rent of over $2,800 a month, you have to have an annual salary of $114,000 to, to afford that without uh, overpaying. And as a result, nearly 60% of Latinx families are rent burdened, with um, half that number paying more than 50% of their income in rent. Uh, homelessness has increased, uh, as I mentioned, uh, despite uh, the, the fact that the homelessness uh, community has created thousands of units of permanent supportive housing. Uh, but um, it, because of the pandemic, it, it has increased. 43% of the homeless population in Santa Clara County is um, uh, Latinx compared to uh, 20, their population, the size of their population is 27%. So significantly more uh, higher percentage of the population, um, homeless population is uh, Latinx. Um, but there's good news to share. Um, first, um, housing has become more of a priority for elected leaders. Not everyone was like Mayor Gonzalez in supporting housing. Uh, and um, it's, it's taken you know, decades really to get the attention of state and federal leaders around housing. And so we've had some important state legislation passed recently, including uh, since we last met, including measures to cap rents and require uh, just cause evictions. Uh, and this year, the governor signed an additional 32 bills, including a historic bill that essentially eliminates single family zoning. The California budget uh, this year includes 22 billion for housing, uh, far, far more that by multiplied, uh, you know, uh, significantly for housing than in past budgets. And we're expecting some more to come because of, of uh, budget surpluses this year. And the, the president's Build Back Better plan, should it get through uh, Congress, uh, hopefully this year, includes $150 billion in funding for housing. So, so that's all good news. Um, uh, as far as Measure A, many of you may know Measure A, and San Mateo had its, San Mateo County also had uh, a funding measure back in 2016. Uh, but we're starting to see that the, the impact of Measure A. 3,600 homes have been built to date and more are on the horizon, or I should say are in process. They've either been built or in process. Um, so that's really good news. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that the issues of race and equity have really highlighted the systemic racism in the, racism in the housing market from zoning to appraisals and home buying to lending products, and that there's so much more attention uh, that I think that that is, is positive for the future. And I look forward uh, to the next report card and seeing uh, how that focus uh, will help improve the report card going forward. Thank you so much, Leslie. And again, thanks for your decades of uh, commitment. And I know it's gonna continue. You're still very active in this space. You know, just another example of how these quality of life areas interface with each other 
we know that one of the challenges in public education with Latino families is that it's not uncommon for a family to literally move from in the middle of a school year because it means that they'll be able to uh, you know, have a rent that maybe is $50 a month less. Well, $50 a month less may mean that that's the food you, you serve you know, for, for dinner for your children. The, the, the flip side of it, the bad side of it, is you're taking your child out of their school, you're taking them possibly out of the same school district, you're moving them in the middle of a school year. Very, very detrimental effects on their education. So unfortunately, these are the, the incredible decisions that our parents are faced with these days, and it's just very, uh, very difficult. Now, you did mention, mention uh, Measure A, and I just want to make sure the audience knows what that is. That's a countywide uh, measure that voters approved with uh, uh, a vote a couple years ago, and it provides, I think, over $900 million in funding for affordable housing. Nine hundred and fifty million for affordable housing and and focusing on extremely low income families and and homelessness. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, thanks again. We'll be back to you shortly. Well, I am very optimistic that we're going to start moving from the D's to possibly the B's and A's uh, with our next area, and that's the area of the environment. Uh, and this is back in twenty eighteen. It was our best our best grade on the report card. And for those of you in the audience today who were in the audience then may remember that it was almost a standing ovation when it was announced that uh, the, the grade for the environmental area, I think it was a B. Now, it's an area that we weren't feeling there then, I hope we're not feeling now, but I uh, wanna bring in uh, Danielle Cedeno. And Danielle, based on your past experiences and your role now at, Hewlett, I mean, at uh, PG&E, what are your thoughts about the use of open spaces, water and air quality and how the Latinx community Interacts, interacts with the, the environment in general. Sure, thanks Ron so much for having me. Uh, happy to be here and thank you for raising these important issues in our community today. Uh, you know, when I think about how the Latinx community engages in issues of the environment and climate change, you know, I think I, I'm a little bit like Leslie, there's some real positives and then there's some challenges as well too. But when I think about these issues, I think about three things in particular. Uh, one, it's clear that climate change has become much more visible, real, and tangible in the past few years. Two, I think the pandemic has clearly highlighted the value of our parks and our open spaces. And then three, would want to comment a bit on the proliferation of environmental and sustainability goals that we're seeing across our sectors, and what is the Latino voice and context in those kinds of plans and discussions. So as we talk about climate change first, it's clear that we're seeing changing climate conditions uh, across our state, in the Bay Area, and here in Silicon Valley as well, too. Even in the past few years, we've witnessed drought, increasingly dry conditions, and high fire threat areas. We've seen thousands of lightning strikes hit those high fire threat areas, causing wildfires and orange skies while we're in a pandemic. And so, again, I think the issues of climate change and environment has really risen to the forefront of the public agenda. And there's so much more to be said in that. But what I do urge us to kind of consider in this space is as we talk about climate change and natural disasters, that leads to discussions of emergency management, preparedness and safety, incredibly important topics. But I also urge us to consider thinking about how do we move from talking about emergency management and move towards community resiliency as a whole. Now, when we zoom in on the pandemic, I think back to the very beginning when we were first starting to go into lockdown, shelter in place. Uh, and I think about where did so many of us go to connect with our loved ones, to find that respite, that breath of fresh air, and find some safe spaces to connect. And so often it was in our parks. And so I think the value of our parks and our open spaces has only risen in these past few years. And I think that that's wonderful. But that leads to a couple of questions though, which is one, how do we maintain and preserve the public spaces and the natural ecosystems that we have. And so I think to city to San Jose, moving forward with preserving Coyote Valley, for instance. Two, how do we ensure that there's equitable investment in these parks for generations to come and then across our communities? Because the data highlights that Latinos have a deep connection to our environment. And the reality is, is that our parks are places where we find our community and connect and culture. And so how do we ensure that this is going to be here for generations to come? And then want to talk a little bit about the Latino voice as it relates to environmental plans and goals and agendas that we're seeing. So I've worked with a number of different environmental groups in my career, 
And I often find that you find the same set of folks having very similar conversations. And so I've paused to say, well, wait a second, Latinos care about climate change too. And so how do we ensure that the lived experiences and perspectives of Latinos are incorporated into these plans and that Latinos are at the leadership table in these discussions? Because the reality is that climate change often disproportionately impacts disadvantaged communities, whether it's urban uh, heat due to lack of tree canopy and greenery, rising bay level waters. Many of us are familiar with smog and uh, emissions due to congestion. But I also urge us to consider newer issues like electric vehicles, for instance. And when we talk about this transition to an all electric future is gonna bring tremendous environmental benefits to our society, but it's going to be a major transformation. And so my question is, how do we ensure that this transition to all electric transportation is for everyone? And I think that that is a really tough question. But so I think that this demonstrates why these sort of issues will require a broader set of stakeholders and more engagement with Latino community in order that we can fully realize so many of these environmental goals that we have. Well, thank you so much, Daniel. Great, great perspectives. And you know, when you were talking about accessibility to open spaces and parks, uh, again, I remember my early days as mayor, you know, we, we kind of did a survey or rather there had been a, a major in-depth study on both the accessibility of city parks and city libraries and so forth. And we were very deficient in a number of low-income neighborhoods. And so we, we went about trying to correct that. But you know, that work can't stop in San Jose. It's gotta go on to neighboring cities. And we gotta look to make sure that even in some of the smaller, medium-sized cities that are suburbs of San Jose and even up in San Mateo County, where you have a lot of medium-sized cities, that we make sure these low-income neighborhoods do have access to parks, do have access to open spaces. And they're encouraged to use those. Um, the other, the other thing that that you you mentioned was air quality, air pollution. I'm hoping that you know if we ever get back to a new normal uh, or get to a new normal, that we we do all we can not to get back to the old normal of traffic congestion and, and just the very poor air quality that we all were experiencing just before the pandemic. That we look at our our transportation systems. We we try to use alternative ways to get to work. And, and possibly some of the larger employers, I know they're exploring this, of not returning full time, you know, 40 hours a work week and in the office. I know many of them have to from uh, a business standpoint, but uh, I just hope that we as a community think about new ways to do things so that it is the new normal. So thank you, Daniel, and we'll be back to you shortly. Um, all right. So to all of our panelists, you know, um, as, as people, as our guests registered for today's event, we asked them, do you feel optimistic that the Latinx community in Silicon Valley has improved its quality of life in 28, since 2018? And the word cloud you see uh, is uh, representative of uh, the mixed yes and no answers of our registrants at the center, uh, in the center of the, the uh, display there. So here's my question to all of you, and then we'll get to the questions in the, that, that uh, our guests have. So, what do you what are you optimistic about in the next report card? What did we or your sector learn from this pandemic? And and um, I'll just randomly call on folks here. Let's start with uh, Dr. Dewan. Um, you know, I'm very optimistic about how we um, identified some of these um, inequities and um, structural issues that existed before the pandemic, but we were able to bring a lot of light to um, during the pandemic and we accelerated some of our activities and investments and advocacy to make really needed changes in these areas. I'll highlight just a couple um, with regard to the digital divide, for example, um, knowing how um, so many of our families don't have access to a robust uh, internet in their homes. And we were able to demonstrate quite effectively that when all the systems come together and we shift our ideas around public investment, we're able to provide the type of internet access that every uh, child, every family needs. And we're seeing both in our local and state policy as well as at the federal level, a recognition 
of broadband as an essential need and essential right for our families. So I think we're going to see that that also translates into increased access to information, to safety, to educational outcomes, opportunity for enrichment uh, for students and families, and access to financial resources and information. So that example, um, I think, is a quite powerful one about what we learned during the pandemic and how it's going to translate into a longer term uh, change in the way that we work together and how we support our Latinx families who have been disproportionately um, and negatively impacted by the lack of access to broadband. And I think another um, area is around uh, mental health and wellness. And just this recognition um, too that there was a crisis that was impacting our children. Uh, we learned during the pandemic about increased rates of anxiety and depression and the impact of social media um, on our young people and their development. And how we were seeing this translate into mm -hmm. um, unhealthy habits that children were developing and in some cases ways that they were pursuing self-medication um, in ways that we would not you know want for our children and so those recognitions are also translating into increased trainings at school sites and for personnel and for parents parent engagement the expansion of wellness centers on school campuses and we're placing these uh, in communities where we know the need is great. And I think that's going to benefit our Latinx students in some very positive ways. Very good. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, Leslie Crisigo, what, what are your thoughts? So you talked a little bit about maybe some of the things that you'd like to see progress with the new report card. Uh, and what, what, what do you think the housing community has learned from this pandemic? Yeah, so so as I mentioned, um, I, you know, I'm I'm excited that uh, there's more of a focus now on affordable housing because that helps us here on the ground be able to achieve uh, some of the the goals that we have. Uh, building housing is an extraordinarily complicated uh, process, and it takes many years uh, to to be able to create more housing opportunities, which means that. It takes years for, for those statistics to change. Um, so I'm so I am, uh, but I again I am optimistic because of the the increased attention on affordable housing and also on how affordable housing is so key to the other issues that we talked about today, to people's health outcomes, uh, to education outcomes, to the environment. Um, and, and I would say that the funding is important, um, but also um, it's really necessary to change hearts and minds around housing and to get people to understand um, the, that the need uh, for housing and, uh, and the need to ensure that we protect our existing communities and um, that uh, that we protect our existing residents who live here who are at risk of displacement uh, the focus uh, that has been on um, on those other issues other than just building more housing but making sure that our residents can stay here and uh, that neighborhoods are, are protected has has been um, has been a change again since uh, since 2018. Uh, so I'm optimistic about about it, and I think that that's going to help, you know, our our Latinx community um, as we move forward. But again, housing takes a long time. All right. Thank you, Leslie. Carla, what what are your thoughts about the next report card and what you'd like to see on the on the on the positive yeah. side? Ron, I'm very optimistic, um, and I'm very inspired too. And that's partially because of our community. Um, you know, the work that the community did during this time was incredible. I cannot tell you how impressive to hear what everybody was doing. And from the smallest, tiniest nonprofits to some of the bigger ones from figuring out how to deliver meals, food, care packages, sweaters, even just calling a senior that can't leave their home. Um, and, then, and then the work that we did around education. I think that is um, a new level of outreach to the community that I think will change change how we interact with the Latinx community and we'll improve it moving forward in the future. So I, I'm very hopeful. And I think that many of the programs that we saw instituted during the pandemic 
may stick around and, and will improve. And I think that there's just a lot to learn from. I also have to say that from a, from a COVID-19 perspective in health, it was inspirational to see what our community clinic partners were doing from going out um, to homeless encampments and passing out backpacks and inviting folks to come in, get vaccinated, get a meal. I mean, it's just incredible the work that we saw. So I'm very optimistic, Ron. Great, that's good to hear. Uh, Gina, what are your what are your thoughts for the positive side of the next couple of years? So I think I think Carla just said it in an extraordinary way. I'm incredibly optimistic because we saw the solutions on the ground. We we saw a community engaged. We saw networks uh, come alive, uh, really in support of the Latinx community. And, and we saw these solutions being designed at a very, very grassroots level. Uh, and, and they took hold. And the systems um, listened and the systems, the systems listened because really the pandemic made it so clear that, that we have systemic injustices that, that need to be addressed. And when you have grassroots organizations really addressing the systems, right, and pushing them forward, I think, you know, that, that gives me such sense of optimism, right? And, and in our own sector in philanthropy, the truth is that we learned a lot. We learned a lot. We learned that without grassroots solutions and investing in nonprofit organizations on the ground that understand their neighborhoods, that understand their communities, um, we're not going to push the needle forward on addressing the systems of, of racial injustice. So, so all that to say that that the, the that COVID, that COVID really provided us. Um, at a very grassroots level, the kind of um, of injection um, that some of us had been, uh, I'm going to say, blind to, and by some of us, I'm I'm obviously referring to philanthropy as a whole. Um, that that I think is going to um, uh, going forward invest in a very targeted way, in a very unapologetic way, on Latin X leaders, on Black leaders, and other other leaders of color that understand their communities, understand the solutions, right, and that can push the, these solutions forward in a systemic way. So those leaders, <laughs> those those uh, folks on the ground, really energize me and give me such a sense of optimism for the future. Great, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Daniel, what are, what are your thoughts about a positive future? Thanks, Ron. I am uh, optimistic uh, for this next report card. You know, I think, like I mentioned earlier, the issues around climate, I think, have really risen to the forefront and in, in the public eye and in the conversations that we've seen among so many different sectors as well, too. And I think that's what's really important here, too, is we see government, private, public nonprofit sectors all looking to see what they can do in this space to go more green, to be more environmentally friendly. We're seeing increasing numbers of households caring deeply about uh, waste, uh, caring deeply about water, about all the different aspects that incorporate our natural resources and systems. I do think as well too, uh, one area that we have some concern is around water, uh, for instance, right? And I think that that is one effect we're seeing due to these changing climate conditions. And climate is such a large issue. It's gonna require not just large corporations and government agencies, but it require all of us to do our part uh, to make sure to fully affect climate change. And so uh, I'm, I'm hopeful and I'm optimistic. I think it's been uh, made very clear here that there's a strong uh, connection to the environment, to our shared resources here amongst uh, Latinos in Silicon Valley. And so I, I think uh, and, and I'm optimistic that we'll see some uh, positive uh, reports coming out in the next report card. Well, thank you so much, Danielle. Uh, you know, uh, we've heard from people on our panel that are in the middle of it all. I mean, when you talk about someone like Carla Rodriguez Lomax, I mean, literally day-to-day uh, -day, uh, <laughs> healthcare warrior for the last almost two years, many others on this panel. So we really thank you for your perspective and your thoughts. So another Carla, Carla Madragon, one of our education program coordinators has been monitoring the chat for questions. Carla, uh, do you have any questions? And as, a, as she reads the questions, I'm just going to ask the panelists to, you know, jump in, unmute yourself, and if you'd like to take the take on the answer, go ahead, Carla. Hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Yes, we have several questions. One question that I'll read out is: What are we going to do as a community to support our undocumented folks who, in the last year and in general, have been at the front lines and who have been greatly impacted by the pandemic? The high cost of living, lack of affordable housing language barriers, discriminatory practices, and predatory financial practices. 
Well, they they uh, summed up the challenge right there. That's a great question. Uh, and I know, uh, uh, Gina, I know the Community Foundation has done some work around immigration. You want to try to answer that question? Yeah. Anyone else was, jump in? I'll just say that, you know, it, it, and this again, uh, 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 proud to be in this region, whereas the rest of the country uh, put out funds for rental relief and other support um, that, that are undocumented, uh, neighbors weren't, uh, uh, didn't have access to, this community jumped and said, um, and really facilitated, and by this community, I mean nonprofit organizations on the ground that really created a, a uh, channel, an easy channel for, for uh, undocumented uh, uh, folks to have access to these benefits. There is so much more that we need to do. Um, every single uh, public benefit um, needs to be able to be accessed by our undocumented neighbors. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of efforts at the legislative level to ensure that, that, that there's, a, there's an expansion of specific benefits, including CTC, EITC, and others around on how to ensure that that our undocumented neighbors have access to them but but this is this is where it starts right it's community organizing to make sure that 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 these um benefits um really benefit those that have been on the front line of of our covid response thank you gina and i and i know that you know the, the impact of covid has been so deep and wide even for our latinos in technology scholarship program we found our many of well all of our students were you know one day on campus the next day they were off campus and out of housing living you know uh, they call it couch surfing living in their cars these kind of things so many of you in the audience were very kind to respond to our plea for funding and we were able to get them emergency funding uh which helped them get through that deep period uh carla what's the next question Next question, is there an indicator for the participation of Latinos and Latinas in designing their urban environments? I am thinking specifically about the airport in East San Jose. Well, that's an interesting question. Who, who wants to take that one as a, it's very specific. You know, also, have, you know, I think a little bit more to, to overall engagement as it comes to uh, design in our urban spaces and how do we think about that uh, as Latinos. You know, when I moved uh, here to San Jose from Los Angeles originally, I was really struck by just how many folks care so deeply about their communities, about their lived places. And I also was thinking through about how are folks organized here in San Jose when we're talking about establishment of new parks, when we're talking about investment in different areas, when we're talking about equity lens to see different policy approaches and such. And so when it comes to various urban design issues and challenges that come up, what I urge us to consider and think about as Latinos as a whole is how, where, where is the Latino voice in this? Is it uh, reactive? Is it proactively engaging? Where are the levers of influence where Latinos can ensure that we are uh, having a coalition when it comes to some of the challenges that we're going to see across our region as we see continued investment in downtown San Jose, for instance, right? So as I think through our urban spaces and our design, it's important, first of all, that Latinos have a voice in that. And are we being reactive or are we proactively organizing ourselves to make sure that we're ready for the types of conversations and, and difficult challenges we're gonna have, not only when it comes to investment in the real estate space, but when it comes to uh, infrastructure investment as a whole as well too, because recently uh, Congress and, and uh, the president just signed a bill uh, authorizing a lot of funding that's gonna go towards uh, green infrastructure. And we're gonna see a lot of government agencies the state looks to build out infrastructure in electric vehicles, uh, batteries, solar, and so many wonderful areas. And I think it's important for the Latino community to be prepared for that and think through what is our voice uh, in those kinds of conversations and decision making. Yeah, that's that's great, Daniel. And the thing that I would add as as someone who's you know was born uh, or not born here, but certainly raised here all my life, I would say that more than any time that I can remember local government, the cities that make up Santa Clara and San Mateo counties, the county governments are, are doing an incredible job of reaching out, making sure that whatever uh, new committee they put together, whatever planning group they put together is inclusive of our community. We as a community need to respond to that. So whoever asked this question or anyone on the, on, the, uh, on the Zoom call today, when you see those requests, sign up, put yourself at the table, you know, be in the room, as they say, and, and be part of the decision making process for your community and for our region. All right, Carla, I think we have time for one more question. 
Okay, great. Uh, last question. Gentrification is a big fear among, uh, among many of us, especially when tech slash international investments keep raising housing prices in the Bay Area. What kind of city government slash tech slash business partnerships are in the horizon? Teachers and blue collar workers can't afford to live here and they are leaving the area and the state. Well, that's that's a that's a slow pitch uh, ball to uh, Leslie Corsiglia, our housing <laughs> expert. Uh, so, I mean, the, the key to uh, our housing solution is that we just haven't built enough housing and we haven't built enough affordable housing. And so because we don't have enough supply, it's raising it's raising those issues and and it's creating um, it's creating displacement. Um, so we have uh, had some tech involvement coming into um, to the housing sector. And so uh, some of the bigger tech organizations like Google and Facebook um, um, and um, um, Apple have provided billions of dollars uh, for affordable housing. And that money is starting to, to uh, be spent. Uh, so, so there are some collaborations that are going on right now. Um, and uh, I think that what we have to do is be very careful and thoughtful as we are building new housing about its impact on our existing neighborhoods and, and our, our people and our communities of color so that we're not uh, you know, creating those housing opportunities and at the same time uh, displacing longtime residents and people who are important to our community. Um, so that's something that we have to continue to be really aware of and, and focused on. Uh, but the answer is right now to be able to, to reduce housing costs, we need to create a lot more affordable housing. And Leslie, do a, do a 60 second commercial on the organization you helped found, SP at Home, and because that really is a collaboration of all those different groups. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so yes, yeah, Silicon Valley at Home is a policy and advocacy organization that works here in the South Bay to create more opportunities uh, for affordable housing and focusing on, on uh, you know, what, what we call the three Ps, which is preservation of existing affordable housing, uh, prevention of displacement, and, and then also production of, of more housing to, to meet the needs. So there's lots of opportunities to get engaged, lots of educational opportunities uh, that SV at Home, um, Silicon Valley at Home uh, has available to people. And so I encourage you to, to look at the website and see the information and also the opportunities for engagement. Thank you, Leslie. Wow, you know, as I said at the beginning, this is an amazing group of panelists who are working on working very hard on improving the quality of life for Silicon Valley Latinos and other communities. And I'm so pleased to hear in their words, hope for the future as many good lessons certainly have been learned from the pandemic. Now I'm glad to report that the 2023 Silicon Valley Latino report card is in the works and we're hoping to present the results of that report card in about a year. Now, despite all our challenges, the good news is that Latinos have ganas and we will continue to have resilience and grit and not give up our rightful place in this region in the future. So I want to again, once again, thank Daniel, our panelists, Daniel, Carla, Gina, Leslie, and Marianne for your time and candid conversation today. And thank you also, all of those of you in the audience for attending the event. Now, again, please take a second to, to answer the short survey at the end of this session. It really helps us plan out our future Latinx speaker programs. So thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again at the next Latinx Speak You series event, hopefully in person. Let's keep our fingers crossed. From all of us at the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley, we wish you a wonderful holiday season and a happy new year.